Recording. There we go. Okay. On this episode of The Right Stuff, we're talking about what makes a good character. I'm Josh Hayes. I'm Scott Moon. And together we make up Keystroke Medium, which is our makeshift company name for now. Until we find something better or something tells somebody tells us we can't do it. Yeah. Um, that could happen, but you know, who knows? <laughs> whatever. Right. Uh, well, I answered first last time. For those of you who don't know, this is our like seventeenth time to record uh, our ep- episode. <laughs> yeah, our uh, our episode tonight, and uh, we've had some technical difficulties because Scott is in Austin, Texas, right now at the Smarter Artist Summit. I said it in one try that time, uh, and so he is working off the hotel's fantastic Wi-Fi. Uh, and we're having some connection issues. So it looks different because he is on his phone right now, which gives him, ironically, it gives him better connection than his computer. So I'm going to ask him first this time. Um, Scott, what do you think makes a great character? Um, well, having this being the third time around to this, I should have a really smooth answer. That's going to be a great answer. It's going to be perfect. It's going to be amazing and insightful. And everybody Keep it right on script. Good job. Um, I think what I look for in a character is, one, the character's going to be very interesting to me and for some way, shape, or form. Uh, it's an intriguing character. And the character has to be taking some pretty distinctive action towards something that matters. And it doesn't always have to be positive. Or, I mean, because, like, you can have – Characters aren't really the the heroes, not the hero. Sometimes the antagonist in a story is the most interesting character in 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 there. You can think of several examples, I'm sure. But uh, so that's the biggest thing. I need a I need a strong character. It doesn't mean they have to be like, you know, black belt ninjutsu, freaking you know, Navy SEAL. Uh, <laughs> But they, they can't be squeamish and like, oh, no, this is just happening to me. And what can I do? And poor me. And I just I can't. I'm so helpless, you know, that type of thing. Or and they have to affect whatever changes in the story. A lot of times if you have a character like they kind of get out of problems because they're part of a great team, which, you know, being a team is great. But um, right. But they're, they're not they're not responsible for the change in the plot or in their character development, it's just happening to them. So I need a character that takes action, I guess. That's the first part. I agree. You, uh, so in take two, you were starting to go into another, another element that I think is pretty important as well. Do you want to go back into that and start all over? Um, yeah, about limitations. Um, but one with honest motivations, like we were, um, if you have a character who, who you build limitations into that makes sense because you don't, I mean, you don't want the Superman character. You don't want a character that can do everything and uh, it will never fail because that's not interesting. Um, In, in real life you fail. Like we've failed several times. I have failed multiple times. We've, we failed on the podcast tonight. Uh, but you know what? We stuck with it and we kept trying to make it work um, because this is something that we really want to do. So making it work is part of working through failure. And that makes a fantastic character. If your character doesn't fail or he doesn't have the chance to fail, then why would I care about what he does? Why would I care about what he wants to do? is for in a lot of cases is, is, um, one, one of the uses for fiction is for us to know that we can handle life or whatever, you know, like, like you wonder why do people watch slasher movies where the people are getting just chopped up and it's so horrible and stuff, but there's usually some kind of resolution, you know, right. so you learn that you can survive violence or the main reason you can survive is because you're in a movie, movie theater. You're not there getting slashed. Part of the <laughs> so, and, <laughs> unless the slasher comes into the movie theater. Or like romances, you know, they, the, one of the big tropes in a lot of romance authors, obviously uh, down here at the smart artist summit, but um, 
one of the big tropes or, or basically rules of romance is that the, the guy and the girl or whatever combination of romantic pairing nowadays, they, if that's the focus of the story, they have to get together in the end. Right. And so, and everybody's tried to have some kind of relationship and they're hard to put together. And so that's what they want to see is the struggle and then happy ending. They get together and live happily ever after or whatever. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, you mentioned tropes, uh, but it's, it, and it's funny to me when you talk about genre fiction and then uh, you hear, you know, you watch, um, oh, you know, mo- movies on the sci-fi channel and they, they throw like every single trope into the, into the movie uh, or uh, really any kind of any kind of genre fiction, romance or sci-fi or fantasy or whatever. And you're always going to have some kind of a trope, like in fantasy, you're always going to have the knight in shining armor. And, um, in a lot of, a lot of popular military science fiction, uh, you're going to have the trope of the alcoholic captain or the, uh, really beautiful female executive officer. That's, or, or the, the, the commander, whether it's female or male or whatever, they're, they're in command of a small ship that is un, un, outgunned. And, yes. You know, yes. So they somehow make it work and so on. And, right. You know, I think if you say trope or, or if you say some of those things, it has a negative connotation, but I don't really see it that way because it's more like um, just a description. Mm -hmm. I want to read a book about a military captain who fights fights and wins a space battle because that's what I'm interested in. That's what I'm reading today. And so I'm going to look for something that is in that genre, has those types of tropes. Now, they can be done better. Obviously, your characters, like we're talking about, what makes a strong character, um, you know, they're going to have some of those tropes, but I guess you want to do it in unexpected ways. Uh, Stephen James is is a, is a, a author who writes some books on writing. He has a book called um, Story Trump Structure. But what he talks about is that your twists, and to some extent, I'm going to extrapolate that this is the same with character development. Your character development has to be surprising and interesting, but it also has to be inevitable. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, if Daniel Craig is is James Bond and stuff. It's inevitable that he's going to defeat the bad guy, but if you can do it in a surprising way, then it's the movie's better than if it's just a bunch of explosions. Right. Yeah, and I agree with you there. And I think, um, and you're right that trope, a trope, isn't necessarily a bad thing, um, but it can be overdone. But I think if you do it the correct way, like you're saying, I want to read a military science fiction story about a captain who commands a spaceship that's outgunned and I want to see I, I want them I want to read it because I want to see what they do and you know maybe they win uh, at the end but but maybe you're gonna have two or three uh, instances in the book where they fail um, but I, and I and I think it's it's really it's really how you pull it off if you can pull off the drunk space captain, and there's a logical reason for him to be a drunk space captain and not that he's just, he's just a drunk space captain. If you I can, we should, if, you, know, you have, you have, uh, you know, in, in science fiction, your, your, your faster than light travel has to have rules, right? Right. So I think that beer should somehow be part of the rules where you have to be a certain amount of drunk to make that work. And that's why you always have a drunk space captain because he's got to get sloshed to make a ship go. Oh, well, I completely agree. Uh, I'll pilot a ship right now. And the great thing about piloting a ship while you're drunk is there's no lines on the road. You have to stay in between. And there's space is big. I'm not going to hit nothing. I mean, you stay within the sector. You know, I guess if you're miles in either direction. I guess if you're jumping into uh, if you're jumping into hyperspace and you haven't plotted it out correctly per the Millennium Falcon rules, uh, that might be bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I'm I'm all down for drunk space captain. I mean, I'm down for that. I'll do that right now. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
So what's your favorite character? We're talking about what makes a good character. Let's 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 go pick out some of our favorites and uh my uh I've got a few favorite characters. Um uh I will God, I didn't make my sign for this week. I'll make it for next episode. I will jump right back on my Sanderson fanboy train and say that um uh says it out of the Mistborn novels is probably one of my favorite characters because uh, he's very soft-spoken. He's very quiet. Um, but it, uh, as you move through the series, you can see his motivations and, and you understand why he is the way he is. Uh, and he's, he's pretty funny too. He's got a really dry sense of humor and he's not the, I mean, he is kind of the old sage that knows everything. Uh, he's a trope, the unexpected trope. It's, he, he's a trope that's surprising in how and how and how he does like we're talking about. Yeah, and he's a, he's interesting. Um, he takes action, but he's kind of almost more of an action for the betterment of others. You know, he's not reacting his own. Yes, way. yes, I I completely agree. Uh, and. Oh, another favorite character. I like um, uh, Have you ever read you you've never read uh, Pandora Star, have you? By Peter F. Hamilton. Um, what's, what's the one you're talking about before the darkness between the stars or or what was that? Oh, um Kevin J. Anderson, The Dark Between the Stars. You know, uh, I'm I'm like halfway through that, I think. Um, but none of the characters really stand out to me in that book. And it, maybe that's a point we can make, too, is... Um, I, brought, brought, I brought it up because um, one of the presenters here is actually, she writes erotica, but she, mm -hmm. and she doesn't, in romance, she doesn't read it. She only reads science fiction. And that's the book that she said she was reading currently. And I haven't read it yet, so... Uh, you know, I'm reading it, and uh, it's it's kind of tough to get into because uh, – okay, so this is going to be a bad comparison, but say Game of Thrones, um, the series, the book of the series, those – his chapters that are point-of-view chapters are 5,000 words long on average, the chapters are – uh, which makes for a really long book, but also gives you a a good amount of time to get into the character's head and you learn a lot about the character through the 5,000 words. And that's an average. I don't know the exact number. Basically, I looked it up and they took the number of chapters in the book and the number the total number of estimated words in the book and just ran an average and it came out to like 5,000, between five and 6,000 words a chapter. Um, so you really get a, a sense of character because you have, you spend a lot of time with them. Yeah. You have 20 or 30 pages with that character and you're like, oh, all right. And then you move on to the next one. And what I think he likes really, what he does really well is he does, he does a cliffhanger kind of at the end of every chapter, and it's like, <clears throat> I want to find out what happens with Tyrion next. But you have to get through Daenerys and you have to get through Stark and you have to get through uh, Arya to find out what happens to Tyrion in the next Tyrion chapter. But but then when you read the Arya chapter, then you want to find out what happens at the end of the Arya chapter too. So it's like a big, like a leapfrog uh, through the novel. With, uh, with A Dark Between the Stars... Uh, the, the the chapter the point of view chapters are very short and and it's the same concept as as uh, Game of Thrones where the the name of the character is included in the chapter so it's like chapter twenty one the name of the character and then it starts with his limited point of view but it's it jumps the in, uh, dark between the stars is that first person it's it's third person limited like like Game of Thrones uh but it's I think we've gone through six, six point of view characters and every chapter may be a couple thousand words. So you, it's not, it's not enough to really build on 
character motivation or choosing a character that you like or or anything like that. It's just it's it's moving very fast and it's very hard to keep up with who's this character and what are they doing and why are they over here? And then by the time you kind of realize where you're at with the character, you've jumped to a new one. So part of what we're talking about, what makes a great character, and this isn't really so much as intrinsic to the character, but what makes a great character for the reader experience is you got to spend enough time with them. Yes. Absolutely. Now you were starting to give a different example and I, I got you totally sidetracked on something else for no reason, but, you were talking about another uh, science fiction book. Oh, oh, Sam. oh, uh, yeah. Peter, the Pandora star by Peter Hamilton. That's another one where it's where he does viewpoint chapters. Well, it's not even viewpoint chapters. He does it weird. Um, unlike a lot of authors where he changes viewpoints per chapter. Uh, Hamilton has, I don't know how he does his chapter lengths because his, his, he he has like four or five characters per chapter sometimes, and it and it's just it's separated by scene breaks, um, right? But but he writes their their voice in such a way and and presents them in such a way that you understand which character you're dealing with when it breaks. Right. Um, but one of his characters is uh, Paula Mayo, and she's a police detective, and the police detective trope sometimes is. Uh, obsessive compulsive and you have to finish what you start and truth wins out all the time and uncorruptible and that kind of thing. And what I thought was kind of interesting with his character is that she is all that. uh, But when you find what you find out is that she was genetically engineered that way. He didn't, he didn't just make her that way because of the trope. And he might've done that too, but he wrote off like assuming that that's how she is by actually writing it into the character and explaining, explaining that about the character. She doesn't have any free will. Uh, She has free will. Um, She is, she was born on a, a world that basically writes their genetic code to be, very good at certain things. So like there are people, there are people that are very good at whatever, let's just say woodworking and they've written the genetic code in such a way that the, the woodworker is content and happy being a woodworker. Um, and so they, they rewrite the genetic, they, they edit the genetic code of, the police officers there to, <clears throat> they always have to finish the case. Um, they can't be corrupted. They can't, they, they can make, they, they have free will, but if they know that someone's guilty and they can prove it, then they can't disregard that fact. They have to go after it. And that comes into play later on in the book where she knows that this person is guilty of this mass atrocity, but she can't do anything about it because she has to have him there and she has to work with him to finish the bigger picture, the bigger mi- mission of what's going on. And she actually starts, she, she starts manifesting physical illness because she's going against what her genetic code is telling her to do to arrest him and bring him to justice. And she's going against that. And that is making her sick. It's making her vomit and, and, get What's kind of like called? it's called uh, Pandora's Star uh, by Peter yeah. F. Hamilton. It's a very good book. There's a lot of a uh, lot of tension within the characters and between the characters. I'm gonna have to read that. Yeah, and and the thing is, is it, it, that she is just one character in that book, and there's there's several characters that are very good in that book that uh, that he builds completely, and that as you go through the series, you learn you know, like any character, a, a lot about them. And, and they're very good, uh, very well written. He does get kind of wordy. Uh, <laughs> so some of them you could probably skip some some parts, but for the most part, they're very good. Yeah. Um, to, let me answer something, so let me check in. Okay. Oh, yeah, no, you're fine. Okay, uh, unrelated to the podcast. So. Let, so let me ask you this. Gonna- we're we're talking about we're, we're coming up on 10 we've got 11 minutes left uh okay. um 
let me ask you this. We're talking about good characters. Um, what do you think, what do you think would make a good villain? Do you think it's the same thing that makes a good, good hero? Or do you think there are differences that you need to include in the villain to make them a good or better villain? Um, well, we talked about this before, about I think we we're talking about, I'd like to move away from villains at all, where everybody's an antagonist to each other or to somebody else. Everybody's an antagonist to somebody in the story. And, you know, whether they're a villain or not, I think a lot of George R. R. Martin's stuff in, in the Game of Thrones is somewhat like that because it's just really unclear. As to, I mean, because like some of my favorite characters in the Game of Thrones are just bad people. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think, oh, look, they're improving. They're, they're going to do the right thing. It's, nope, they're not. <laughs> so, I was like, that was that. Now I remember why I hated that person when I first met him because mm-hmm. he killed the butcher's boy. You know, yes. Sandor, you start kind of rooting for Sandor because he's sticking up for Sansa and he doesn't yeah. give a shit about anybody else. And, you know, he's like, I he doesn't want to be called a knight because he's like, I don't need their rules. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And, hey, yep. And he's, real, he's like, I love killing. That's great. That's what I do. And and then and then you get to the point at the end and you, re, you remember some of the early scenes. I'm like, he killed the butcher's boy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, and then I'm pretty sure I haven't. It's been a while since I've read the book, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they. Yeah, I talk about what make what makes a good character. And I think you know a strong character. He's a strong character. He's obviously extremely flawed. Right. And and I, I know people don't like Sansa because she's just getting pushed around and she's such a victim. But I think she's going to in the books. I don't know what she's doing in the in the. In the I started watching some episode five and I was kind of disappointed. But in the books, her story is far from being resolved and I'm wondering if she's going to uh, maybe develop a little bit. You know, I, I, if, if you go off the rest of the female characters in his book or books that aren't whores, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because he tends to kill off the whores in his book. Uh, yeah. But if you go off the rest of the characters, um, they they get drugged through the mud. The rest of the female characters they get drugged through the mud pretty good. But at the end, they come out on top. Uh, Why does anybody in his world, but especially not women, they have a hard life in, in the game of, in Westeros. Yeah, they do. They, but you know what? But but everybody seems to do. I mean, women have it slightly harder than men do. Obviously, in his world. Uh, his world uh, is is pretty brutal, uh, and and rightfully so for the the setting and and what's going on in the world. Uh, but I think Sansa, I think she'll come out on top. I think I'm not sure if she's going to be uh, the Lord of Winterfell or anything, uh, but I think she's going to come out on top eventually. I think uh, at least I hope she does. She could get her lose her head like her dad. Yeah, just all the Starks would be dead. And, um, but yeah, I, I've kind of wondered if she's not going to wind up being a lot stronger at some point if she makes it through all this other stuff. So, Who's your um, favorite character in your writing? In my writing? Um, <clears throat> yeah, in my work in progress, I think my favorite character is um, is Rebecca LaCroix. She's a lieutenant and she's a mech, mech commander, commander of a mech unit, and in the book, the sequel, or prequel, I'm sorry, the, the book two in the series, the book from what I'm on now, um, Son of Orlon, it's uh, Orlon. Okay. That's his name. And that's the sergeant, right? Yeah, and um, I can't talk a lot about his story arc for people who haven't read it, but, you know, there's some things about his story arc that's a little bit uh, George R. R. Martin-ish, but I like him because he's a badass. Mm-hmm. And in the first book, you know, he's portrayed as being kind of a kind of a mercenary, self-centered, you know, wants to drag Ken in and get the reward and just will kill anybody. He's just real brutal. He's also a bit of an artist um, if you, for people who read the books. But 
So he's so selfish and ruthless, but in the fir- in the opening of, of uh, Son of Orlon, he's saving his son, his illegitimate son, mm-hmm. from a whorehouse, basically. <laughs> but uh, you know, and and you like him because he's he's going to go in and stand up and and uh, you know do the right thing for once, and and you just you admire his strength, even if he's kind of an asshole still. Absolutely. It also helps with my, my audiobook reader when when he did uh, when he did Orlon, he gave him kind of a Scottish brogue, which I didn't expect. And I was like, holy shit, that's exactly how he would talk. <laughs> <laughs> that's good, Scott. Yeah. Uh, I don't yeah. I, I, after reading the uh, the first book, uh, Enemy of Man, uh, I I didn't put that together the scottish bit on his character but i could definitely see it uh that's that's an interesting yeah, take on that yeah so and then now okay so talking about you know your favorite character or or what what you do to make a character um some of these criteria that we're throwing out there um my favorite character to to write in my current series, uh, in my second star series, it would probably be Bella, who is a very immature, kind of happy-go-lucky, doesn't think of the consequences type uh, teenager. However, she's extremely smart and uh, very mechanically inclined. Um, it, 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 and it's fun to, to write her because you can kind of just do whatever you want. And you can, if she says something silly, uh, then that's okay because she's silly. And so you can, I can go through a scene and write, you know, silly things like she says, "Oh man," and she, you know, pumps her fist in the air or or does, you know, just <laughs> does something completely like, "Oh man, I, I wish I would have done that." And that's it's it's kind of fun to uh to write a character that that isn't serious all the time and and can kind of just say silly things because most of the characters you know you when you write adult characters uh adult characters in fiction generally aren't silly unless you're writing like a comedy or something uh i mean they may tell a joke uh here and there and 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 you know have that uh, camaraderie between one another during the scene, but they generally aren't silly. And so it's, it's kind of fun to write. Sarcastic or critical or. Right. Yeah, exactly. But it's not, it's not quite the same. No. And, and yeah, so I, I'd have to say that, that writing Bella is probably, um, the funnest character, the most interesting character, um, and, and getting into the third book where I'm almost done with uh, Shadows of Neverland, uh, this is why I wish I would have written the entire story in one book instead of trying to serialize it because now I'm, I'm developing the characters so much more than I already – than I had developed them when I wrote the first book. Uh, and I don't want to interrupt you, but – you remind me to talk about that because that came up at the Smart Artist Conference, what you're talking about. With right okay, now. I'll, I'll ask you about that on the next episode. Um, but yeah, so uh, I I really wish that I, I, I could have developed the characters more because there's a lot of stuff that I could have included in kind of like a foreshadowing kind of uh, way in the first book and even in the second book where – I had a lot of opportunity to develop the characters and, and for whatever reason, they seem to be building on themselves a lot more in the third book. Um, and I think by the fourth book, they're, they're going to even grow even more and which is how I have it planned. But uh, I, I tell you what I've, I've in book two um, when I was book two of Neverland or the, uh, second star series there's a lot the, the characters um there's some good characters in there so i'm looking forward to reading the rest of the third one. yeah uh hopefully it'll be done here in the next month or so i just actually i i uh, just got invited to 
write a short story for an anthology that's coming out in, I think it closes the end of August. Uh, and I've just, I've, I started brainstorming today, uh, just ideas and they sent me the reference material. I'll have to talk to you about it and, and, and let you give, get, get your thoughts on it. <clears throat> uh, but I think I'll have some fun with creating some interesting characters in that one too. Uh, in, uh, in talking about that and talking about, uh, characters, um, the, the theme of, of this podcast, so how important is, is having a good character? Do you think either in what you're creating for you to do it or for what you're creating, either one? How important is that? Is it more important than the plot? It's kind of a backwards way of going to the plot. Well, no, I, I, you know, I think, uh, I think that having, you know, that uh, I, I was listening to a podcast today where they were talking about, um, character novel versus a plot novel. And uh, they basically, they were saying uh, that character novels are boring uh, if you don't have plot. So I, I kind of agree with it in, in the sense that if all that you have is your characters, I can see how that could be like a character study novel where it could be meh, whatever. It's it's good, but you have to have a you have to have a good conflict. You have to have a good plot to push those characters somewhere. Um, so, I think that you need to have a combination of of the two good characters and good plot. Um, but I think that having fantastic characters and a mild plot is better than having a fantastic plot and mild characters. You can, I think that you can have just a, uh, a bare bones plot with some conflict thrown in. Uh, and I agree because the plots are all the same anyway. Well, well, and it, it, if you don't care about the characters, then why would you care about the conflict you're throwing them in? So, yeah, you have to, the characters are, that's why you read the stories. I mean, yeah, you're going to read them to, to find out what happens and, and to read the idea and, and learn about it. But if, if, if you don't care about the characters, then in my opinion, you, you, the book isn't any good. And that's why I kind of stopped reading uh, the Expanse uh novels by uh Jess, James S.A. Corey because the first two books were very good character driven I mean it was plot there was a lot of plot but the first two books had really good characters they were really fleshed out and there were some you know there were some big tropes that were used in those two books but I still felt like you got to know those characters and you could follow along with them on their journey and then when you get to book three you have less and less interaction with those characters as the plot moves. And then you get to book four and there, well, I think there's, I think there's six and they're coming out with a seventh one here pretty soon, but I started book four and I couldn't get, I mean, I think I got maybe two or three chapters into book four before I was like, it, it, it's, it, it turned from a character, a good character driven novel to, almost completely plot driven. And I really didn't care about the characters because there was just so many different ones, but you know, it, they're doing pretty well and they've got a TV show. So who am I to judge them? Uh, All right, there you go. But, um, but uh, we're wrapping up on our, our new show time. Now I think we just hit half an hour. Um, I think this is a good place to wrap it up. Do you have any last final thoughts for the, uh, the episode oh my, my last thoughts basically is that, uh, that whatever whatever the character is trying to achieve or whatever the problem is the conflict it, i think it drives the story and i think so having a good character is important um so i want to get, come back to this one i think that we maybe barely scratched the surface on this topic so we may have to revisit this how to make a good character i agree i agree well, you want to give a an, uh, or sign us off or whatever you're doing on that end, and, and all then I'll hang up my phone. Okay. 
And, and you look fantastic on it. I, I just say that. <clears throat> it's, uh, next for the next video, you need to get up and like do a like a three sixty pan of where you're at, and we'll just follow you around to get dizzy. Uh, so we're going to sign off here. If you guys are interested, we'll be doing another blab here in about five minutes, uh, where Scott's going to talk to us about, uh, his experience down at the smarter artist summit. Uh, it'll be live here in a couple minutes. And for those of you listening on the feed, it'll be next week, uh, next Friday, uh, for episode five, uh, the smarter artist summit. Thanks for joining us guys. And, uh, we'll see you later. Yep. Everybody. See you next time. Thanks for coming.